Ha ha. The early birds. I'm impressed. <laughs> you should all... Um, you can you all should, sit up here. No. You can all come forward. We're gonna, we are going to have cold calling. Um, <laughs> That's right. I think, I'm told people will f- filter in. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we're going to go ahead anyway and have a fantastic conversation. And to wake you up, we're going to... Let me show you a very quick uh, video. So can we... Can you guys cue that up? Note, note your discount code. Um, I'm David Bank. I'm the editor of Impact Alpha. Uh, we are a five-day-a-week morning newsletter around impact investing. We have a podcast. We have a Slack channel. We have, a, we have conference calls. We're trying to build a community around what we call, as you saw in there, agents of impact, of which you all are, um, especially for getting up so early. And um, uh, although Mariana went surfing this morning. <laughs> um, <laughs> so... Um, and, uh, but in my previous life, I was a tech reporter, uh, including for the Wall Street Journal, and um, I've always thought that there's this nice parallelism between the way the tech story developed and the way the impact story is developing. And there's a set of ideas that are first not well understood, and then over a course of a couple year, few years become, in effect, conventional wisdom and the new normal. And, um, and tech, you know, went, through that, there was a time when you couldn't talk about APIs. You know, people didn't actually know what you were m- meaning, and they didn't know what network effects were, or virtuous cycles, or increasing returns to scale, which is something I want to get into. Um, and now that's just the way the world works. And impact, in particular, social environmental impact, um, is going through the same trajectory. It's g- gradually gone from a fringy, um, a fringy, you know affectation of some, you know, enviro greenies or what have you, and now it's increasingly, you can just see it all around, you can see it all at SOCAP, but everywhere, you, it's, it's increasingly part of the way the financial system of the future is going to be, is going to work, and whether it's, whether that's a one-year project or a five-year project, that's sort of the details, but that sort of same trajectory where the whole system isn't changing the same way that the internet and chips and Moore's Law changed, 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 um, changed the world so is impact. Um, I was thinking this morning, it's not like some future thing. Like there's 500,000 Californians without power this morning. There's fires (laughs) raging in Sonoma. It's, you know, like the need is there. And so what Seth and Mariana are talking about is bringing the exponential power of tech, the rigor and um, authenticity and engagement of impact and solving some big challenges. So that's what we're going to... We're going to solve them all today? I don't know. We're going we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna, to we're gonna get started. Um, uh, so let me just introduce you very briefly, and then I'll let you say more about yourself. Seth, actually, I met at SOCAP a few years ago um, and uh, have watched as 50 years his venture fund, has venture firm has um, done some amazing things, and you've just raised the second fund. So 50, the headline we had was 50 million for 50 years. I don't know, was that... Yeah, that's that was the, the yeah, idea yeah. to get that headline. <laughs> <laughs> I got it. Yeah, um, um, but uh, uh, and you could say more about your Y Combinator background and whatnot. We'll, we'll get into that. Mariana Senko is with Future Ventures, um, and they have a first fund that is two hundred million dollars, um, and um, and both of them come out of the tech side. They're not; these are not impact funds that are thinking about tech solutions. These are tech funds that are thinking about impact. So um, uh, let's see, where can we get started? Um, what I was hoping to do actually was, um, instead of sort of having the, the, the philosophy first, I was thinking of having the specifics first and throw them, <laughs> you know, get the, lead up, get the lead up high, as we say. Um, uh, so maybe, Seth, I don't, first of all, you can explain what the, an investment committee actually means it at 50 years. But if you were in the investment committee and you were taking 
your company and you were now making the pitch for it, I want to understand how you pitch impact and how that figures, it, you know, and you can, I don't want to set you up too much so you can take it, but you're now presenting, let's take um, Salugen, mm -hmm. um, and you're, I don't know who you, tell me, you tell us who you have to convince, but now convince us why we should, why we should approve this uh, investment in Salugen. Uh, yeah, so I mean, for, for, uh, for 50 years, we have a very small sort of investment committee. It's just the two partners. <laughs> uh, I co-founded this with a woman named Ella Made, who is a, a much more successful entrepreneur than I am. Founded three companies, sold, sold two of them. Um, and so, you know, what we look for uh, fundamentally is, is three things. Uh, companies that have the potential to be massive businesses. Companies that have the potential to have massive positive social or environmental impact. Uh, and then founders that we think are both capable of building it and also care about both of those things, right? So we want founders that genuinely want to build big businesses, uh, and we want founders that genuinely want to have positive impact. And so, um, you know, the, the impact analysis looks very different company to company. So in a case like Solugen, it's, it's very, very clear. So what Solugen does is uh, they have an enzymatic process um, that replaces the current way we produce uh, a chemical called hydrogen peroxide. So hydrogen peroxide um, is currently produced through this process called the anthraquinine process. Um, it requires these $150 million plants, seven football fields large. Uh, they use petroleum-based inputs, so very unsustainable. There's about 70 different reactions that happen. Each of these reactions is very volatile. So um, literally every year for the last five years, one of these plants somewhere in the world has exploded. People die. Toxic fumes get released into the atmosphere. Um, and for every ton of hydrogen and peroxide produce, these anthraquinine plants release 2.5 tons of CO2, uh, greenhouse gas, into the atmosphere. So it's, it's just a nasty process in every way. And so Solugen literally feeds plant sugars uh, uh, to these enzymes, and these enzymes crank out hydrogen peroxide. Um, and not only is it completely safe and completely sustainable and cheaper than the existing process, um, but for every ton of hydrogen peroxide that Solugen makes, they actually sequester six tons of CO2 from the atmosphere. So it's a net uh, a minus 8.5 tons of CO2 for every ton of hydrogen peroxide produced. So in that case, the sort of impact analysis is very, very clear, right? This, is just, this literally just takes greenhouse gas emissions out of the atmosphere. And so all we need to do in that case is basically look into the technology and say, do we actually believe that that's the case, right? And so we'll typically pull in PhDs to actually dive into the technology to make sure that um, we believe that. But um, I think when it gets more interesting um, is when the impact uh, is not so obvious, right? So uh, we, we, we have a company in our portfolio called Catalog DNA. So they, they store data in DNA. So these DNA molecules to actually store data there. Um, and so, you know, the impact there w w was, was potentially twofold. So one, there's a lot of really important information, either biomedical information or, say, physics information like CERN that just gets thrown out today because we don't have the capacity to store it all. And so this, the, the catalog team said, what if we could just store all of humanity's information. That way we could potentially accelerate the pace of science and discovery and these sorts of things. Um, and then the second thing was they said that we think um, storing data in DNA will be more energy efficient and sustainable. Um, and the first uh, sort of impact uh, uh, angle was interesting to us, but wasn't enough. And so we actually asked them, like, bring us more data on the second. And so they pulled a bunch of uh, resources, and it turns out that data centers actually consume 3% of the world's electricity globally, right? So these are incredibly unsustainable things. In, in the United States, um, it, they consume so much, in, so much energy, consume so much energy that it would take 34 500 megawatt coal plants just to power them, right? And what's beautiful about DNA is when you store it in DNA, you actually need zero energy to keep it stored there because uh, DNA doesn't require any in energy inputs to store it. And so it turns out that this could be a massive sustainability plus, right? And so that was a little bit harder. It took us longer to get there, but we ended up getting there and, and invested. Okay, so let, let's just take it very quickly, and, and then I want to get to Mariana. But in the first case, you found a company with a process. I think, as I remember, saw you, Jen, their secret sauce is they can make these enzymes way cheaper because they have some, I think you see Berkeley scientist types who figured out a way to generate these enzymes. So there's a, a t the, the fable 10x cost reduction mm -hmm. that, that mm -hmm. you all look for, right? Um, uh, but did you go looking for somebody to disrupt the petrochemical industry? Did somebody just find you and say, we've, we're gonna, we've got this thing that's going to you know, sell a lot of hydrogen peroxide? I mean, um, what, we, what, did, we did it come as an impact idea, or did you go look for it as an impact idea, or did it just come as in the door as so a good we, tech idea? We do not 
uh, separate I impact from great business. So when we look for something, we're not looking for a great business and then saying, oh, does it have impact? We're not looking for impact and saying, has, does it have a great business? We just look for things that are great businesses that will have impact. Okay, so um, and so in that particular case, we read about them, said, oh, wow, sustainable, sustainable production technology could potentially be cheaper than the existing process, checks both boxes, let's go, and we found the team, talked to them, and ended up investing. Okay, then in the second case, um, they come to you, you say, great business, but you, as you said, kind of g g general, you know, goodness kind of thesis, but not specific enough. Then you went looking yep. for something that you could count, measure, calculate as an impact so that then it could become an... Exactly. The difficult... So sometimes you meet a company, obviously great business, obviously great impact, and then you just need to say, like, can this team pull it off? And th those are easy. Um, the difficult ones are sometimes you say, wow, this would have amazing impact, but I don't, I don't believe the business model, right? I don't see how this gets to a billion dollars a year in revenue, which is what we look for. And on the flip side, sometimes you say, oh, wow, this will obviously be a good business, but like, is this actually genuinely good for the world? Does the world need this? Um, and those are the tricky ones. And so that, I think when we have the most contentious discussions um, between Ella and myself and our, our, our third person, Xiao, it's, it's those cases where we believe in the business, but maybe the impact isn't so clear, or we love the impact, but we can't necessarily get uh, bought in on the business. Yeah. Okay. Marion, let's uh, sort of same question, which is, and I think you may have the same size investment committee, <laughs> maybe even smaller, right? Um, um, but you're taking something like Commonwealth Fusion to the decision makers, let's just call it that, <laughs> and, um, and, and you're trying to say why, this, um, why, this should, why we should invest in this. Do, does, does, ha, where does impact play in that pitch? Yeah, so um, for calibration, uh, also a, a a two-person partnership. So uh, my co-founder Steve Jurvitson and I started this fund a year ago, and uh, we have deeply overlapping philosophies. Basically, our, our Venn diagram of um, interests and motivation is, is basically a circle, and so that you know it's a good place to start a partnership from. And um, although our, our technical capabilities kind of come at it from different angles, some recovering uh, physicists and material scientists, and, and he's an electrical engineer and, and kind of computer scientist, and so we, we tend to look at the same problem statements from slightly different um, technical angles and impact angles. So uh, again, two-person committee, uh, which is really just uh, one of us gets really excited and then starts texting or calling the other and saying, uh, I don't really care where you are or what you're doing. You need to come look at this and see this and, and you know, talk me off a cliff because uh, generally one of us will get really excited and passionate and do a bunch of homework and present uh, the argument to the other. Uh, and then you'll inherently step um, as the other into a devil's advocate play where, you know, is this really going to work? I've seen this with Steve. He's, he's been in the industry for a long time. So he'll basically say, you know, I've seen this 20 times over 20 years um, and, and vice versa. And so we basically game it out. And again, uh, similar to Seth's point, the most contentious discussions are actually the most interesting because if both of us are immediately a yes, then we actually really pump the brakes <laughs> and say, why is this so obvious? Um, because there, there really are no obvious good ideas that haven't been done yet. So there, there's always a trick. There's always some question of why, will, why won't this work? Why will this fail? And you know, it's, it's team, it's capital requirement, it's total level of impact. Um, it's just, you know, is, is it technically feasible from a first principle physics question, uh, which tends to be a lot of what we consider is, you know, like this, you know, founders tend to have these beautiful reality distortion fields of what they're going to create in the world. Uh, and you just kind of have to question them, question them on uh, in which way are they delusional, uh, you know, in this beautiful way where they're going to create a fundamentally better world or one where they're slightly undermining kind of the basic principles of physics of the world, and then maybe we question if it's even possible. Um, so with Commonwealth Fusion Systems, with, with all of that caveat, essentially what happened is a friend of mine at MIT called and said, I have something properly nuts for you to look at, uh, which always kind of gets me out of bed in the morning, other than surf. And, um, and she said, you have to come to Boston and you need to meet this new nuclear fusion company. Uh, and I have to say that the first thing I said is, uh, that's great, thank you for calling me, and hard no, just hard pass. Um, not because I don't think nuclear fusion is the right solution, I'm actually a little bit obsessed with it, it's just um, there's so many problems and most of them come down to regulation 
and uh, cost of capital, right? So Europe is building a giant fusion reactor, but it's going to cost $100 billion. It's still not obvious that it's going to work. We know that tokamak physics are reasonable, but the size and scale at which you have to build these plants basically makes them economic nightmares. Uh, and so with a long list of, I will go see this company as a favor to you, friend, but I'm going to very gently tell them, like, thanks and good luck. Um, Fast forward, got on a plane, got to Boston, toured the facility, met the team. My jaw hit the floor. Um, one of the fundamental things we look for is, are incredible people leaving otherwise very, very comfortable, cushy, brilliant jobs to join the lifeboat that is a startup, you know, entering the seas of, of all of the ways in which they will drown? Uh, and that was the thing with Commonwealth Fusion is, is I saw one of the most phenomenal teams uh, and, you know, teams leaving other portfolio companies like SpaceX, uh, which is literally a rocket ship, right, um, to join <laughs> this weird little MIT nuclear fusion company. Uh, and, and that was the thing that, so w then basically we did a bunch of diligence and, you know, asked the questions like, from a regulation standpoint, do the nuclear physics work? Do the magnetics work? Does the energy transfer work? And um, flew in scientists from all over the world, asked a lot of questions, did a lot of homework to the point of saying, you know, we're, there's a lot of unanswered questions on the technology, but we feel confident that it's generally in the correct trajectory. The team is phenomenal. And the impact question was trivial. It was basically like, solve nuclear fusion, solve a lot of world's problems, right? Like so many of the world's issues are around energy scarcity. So if we can change the energy scarcity equation, you, you fundamentally fix, well, maybe you don't fix, but you, you start addressing an enormous percentage of the world's- um, Scarcity and carbon yeah, footprint. problems, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Um, actually, that's interesting. I was gonna get to this later, but you, you raised it. So you said, are smart people leaving good jobs to go do this? So we have a little section of, of Impact Alpha, follow the talent, which is mm -hmm. the same idea. That's right. Which is, and in fact, in this impact world, a lot of people are leaving good jobs to go do impact. They're, now, they're not necessarily raising $200 million first funds. <laughs> so there's you know, some, some different motivations in some, in some cases. Um, but, but in fact, but one of the things you mentioned in the pre-call was um, carbon sequestration is something that people are leaving good jobs yeah. now to do. And you guys had a impact tech. Seth and, and Ella run a, a, sem a symposium series called impact.tech, um, which I recommend to you. Um, it's where I actually met Mariana the first time. Um, and, um, uh, and you both are, are keen on, on carbon sequestration. So um, let's take that example and then we'll get into the sort of broader. Uh, yeah, it's an interesting, so full stop, we haven't funded anything in carbon sequestration yet, hopefully, you know, knock on wood, I'm looking. Um, and, and that's the point is that, you know, as a fund, we're not necessarily saying, um, we really want a nuclear fusion deal, so let's go look at all of the companies. It's, it's a push and a pull. So we, we try to um, look at areas where the talent is moving and say, okay, let's go get somewhat informed in that space. Um, we... I'm not claiming that we're experts in any particular, we're experts in the things that we're experts in, but then we try to move out into adjacencies and say, where is the talent going? Where is the impact? Because everything is about timing, right? We're venture capitalists. Uh, being early is as bad as being wrong. Uh, and, and so I think that carbon sequestration is a really interesting space right now because there is an enormous amount of talent moving into it. Um, my problem with it to date is everything I've seen is not... Um, well, I should be careful because you probably funded things in it, but, uh, <laughs> and maybe I haven't seen the companies. Uh, of the things I've seen, I have yet to see something at sufficient scale that it's gotten me excited. I've seen some small improvements, some, Im some marginal Im improvements. In but let me stop you. Scale. What would scale, what would appropriate scale be, mean to you? Oh, man, I should, I should have done my homework a little bit better. Um, it, it has to have fundamental change. So it, it can't be like a 1% or 2% improvement on current process it needs everything needs to be it, it needs to have the promise of basically a thousand x or you know metric metric tons of carbon removal and sequestration because um marginal projects have marginal solutions basically and they're at the end of the day you'll pour a bunch of capital into something that doesn't make a a mar a a big difference and, and what we see is that we're creating a lot more carbon than we're actually sequestering so that the solution that is actually meaningful in five, ten years when it probably will hit market 
has to have enormous promise. It has to be on the level of, um, you know, uh, maybe not replacing, but um, uh, like a coherent solution that's the equivalent of like a third of the canopy of the Brazilian rainforest because it turns out we're going to burn it by then. Uh, so if you're not if you're not thinking really big scale, then you're not probably thinking big enough. And then in scale, and, that, and that's an interesting. The way you went there is scale of impact, right? Which you know at some level it correlates to scale of business. That's but, right. But you put it as if you can solve the big challenge, you've told me the business case will present itself. That's right. Um, uh, so so that is a sort of impact first way to look at it, which is the cha the challenge is big enough, the solution then is big enough then the business will be big enough. Yeah, we kind of joke a little bit that we, we don't really do, I mean, we do a market analysis, but we don't do that much of a market analysis for our early stage companies because if the idea is sufficiently, like if you solve nuclear fusion or if you figure out how to do really, really efficient data storage and transfer, like the market's there. I mean, I don't, I don't need a bottoms up analysis from McKinsey to tell me that it's a good idea. And also those numbers don't mean anything. Uh, Seth, Seth <laughs> let, me give you, let, me, let me give you the slightly curveball here. Mm -hmm. One of the things I learned at that session was that the biggest customer for the carbon that gets sequestered by some of these companies is the oil and gas industry, which pumps it back into the ground to pump more oil out. Mm -hmm. um, and there was an interesting discussion. Is that, like, is that why we're sequestering carbon, to, make the, to let the oil and gas industry have a cheaper way to pump more oil? That seems kind of non-impacty. Um, so, yeah, I think, on the other hand, it's what, where the revenues can come from yeah. for these startups. So how do you deal with that kind of thing? Well, so I think... Um, we also have not made any investments in the space, despite being uh, <laughs> incredibly en enthusiastic about it. Um, and That's fine, uh, yeah, so you know, and I'll answer your question in a second. But I think you were t we're touching upon, I think, one of the really uh, unique distinctions between the way we approach it and the way a lot of other say people at SoCap approach it, right? Where if there was a company that could guaranteed, um, m you know, remove ten thousand megatons of CO two uh, a year and and make. $20 million a year, but that, was, but that was probably it. There's a lot of funders here that would be in incredibly yeah. enthusiastic about that. We wouldn't, That's right. right? And it's weird because we, we're looking for things, you know, we want things that could have potentially remove a gigaton a, a year and, and make, you know, a billion dollars a year. And we would much rather um, support something that has less of a chance of succeeding overall uh, but, but, but a greater chance of really hitting a home run, right? Um, and so it's, it's this weird, venture capital is a very weird space where um, you're willing to take ex extraordinary risk um, so long as the financial and impact upside is just absolutely massive. Um, and, and then, so in terms of the, the oil industry sort of uh, being larger consumers in these carbon markets, I, I think, of course, it would be better if, if it wasn't them. But at the end of the day, a lot of these carbon removal technologies, and the reason we haven't funded any of them is they're all, there's a lot of really interesting ones in the mechanical space and the biological space and, and, the, and the chemical space that are, that are per taking greenhouse gas uh, out of the air and turning it into products that they can sell. And they're all just on the wrong side of profitable. Um, and so this is a problem because if you can, you know, t take a take a penny and then sell it for, or t I guess take a, a a dime and then sell it for nine cents, right? It's not a not a very scalable business model. However, these carbon markets potentially offer a way for them to take that nine cents and bring it up to 14 cents. And now they're, they're doing it profitably. But the problem with all these carbon markets is they're incredibly small and they're incredibly nascent, right? Um, and so um, the oil industry buying these, the, these things is actually potentially a really good thing long term because it's at least providing some seed funding, some liquidity to these carbon markets, which then might allow them to grow to scale where you're having a lot of different sort of corporations participating in them. Although we think that those markets are not really going to reach the scale that's meaningful unless there's you know, regulatory change on a mass scale. And for us, um, and this is just a, a quirk of the way we think about things, we are very comfortable with technical risk or even comfortable with market risk. We're not comfortable with, with that kind of regulatory risk. So we have a, a, a test we call the Mr. Burns test, right? Which is, um, <laughs> Mr. Burns is a character from The Simpsons, and he's basically the, the prototype of a self-absorbed, greedy capitalist, right? And so we want companies that are making products that Mr. Burns would buy, right? Just because it's the best thing he can get at the cheapest cost and is the most convenient but that, oh, by the way, are also really sustainable for the world or are improving health or solving malnutrition or these sorts of things. Um, and so we don't like relying on a government subsidy for the companies that we fund to be successful. Hmm. Okay, so there's a bunch of threads coming out here, which we'll try to, by the end, have drawn together. Risk. <laughs> um, you say, we, you would like risk. So the impact world is always saying, oh, 
we could be you know, um, going in and providing a solution for low-income customers in an emerging market, but, um, but everybody thinks that's a risky bet. And, and so, they, so then they spend a lot of time you know, de-risking that deal, and there's first loss guarantees, and there's this and that, to make it less risky so that, quote, mainstream investors will be able to go into this otherwise risky thing. On the other hand, you guys are saying, bring on the risk. So how do, how do you put that together? So I think it's important to remember, we're not mainstream investors, right? So venture capital, to your point, is, is this weird little world. Um, and it, we happen to have this privilege and fortune of literally getting to um, turn large piles into money into hopefully much larger piles of money. But that's the point, is that that's actually a requirement for us. We, we do have to generate returns. Uh, and that means that we can't play to the mean. Um, this is not a game of averages. Uh, venture capital never is, and anyone who tries to play it that way will fail rather spectacularly. Uh, you always play to the moonshots, to the extreme case, because the simple reality is in all venture funds, 90% uh, of the all returns are generated by one company, and it's a power law from there. So in every fund, there's one outstanding rock star. And so you're, you're constantly making the insane bet under the assumption that one of these, hopefully, God willing, will work out, and the rest of them can go to zero, but it doesn't matter because the success stories are so enormous. So you have to believe that every single one is unduly large in its um, future vision, uh, because anything that looks like, oh, that'll work out, like that's a reasonable business, is a really bad business for us. I was uh, speaking at a, a food tech conference in, in Korea, where there's not a, a really established venture capital ecosystem, and there were a lot of investors in the room who were from sort of other asset classes. And I had a conversation with someone who, and it really reminded me how weird venture capital is. He, <laughs> said, you know, he said, what do you do? I said, oh, I, I you know, run a fund, we invest in companies. He said, oh, do you, you invest in large companies? And I said, oh, no, no, they're small, oftentimes just a couple people. And he said, oh, 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 but, but profitable companies? And I said, no, no, nope, just about all of them are losing money. <laughs> and he said, oh, but these are companies that you, you think will succeed. And I was like, well, no, you know, many of them probably are going to fail. And he, he just had this quizzical look on his face. <laughs> like, why? Right? Why would you do that? Um, and, and, it's and it's because of the dynamic that Mariana just talked about. And I think I, I love, like SoCap, I love the world of impact investing. I feel, I feel so aligned here because everyone is, is pointing their, their lives in meaningful directions and is fulfilled and happy and, and actually doing good in the world. I think the one place I feel a little bit out of place is that there is a, a, an extreme aversion to risk here, yes. right? And so um, the vast majority of investors are very uncomfortable with a company that, say, has only a 20% chance of succeeding, but if they succeed, could eliminate an entire category of problems, right? And for us, that's a bet we would take right. all day Every long, day. right? right. Um, so, you know, one of our companies is called Memphis Meats, right? Mm. So they, they are, they're, they're cultivating real meat to eat without the cows. So they basically, they harvest it from cells directly instead of from, from animals. Um, and, and when we, we, we invested at the seed stage, and this is a, a, an incredibly interesting company because animal agriculture contributes more to greenhouse gas emissions than all of transportation combined. Every car, train, truck, plane, and boat combined. Animal agriculture is a worse offender. And, and, and it's really hard to move people off of meat because they love it, they like it. It's a, it's a part of their habits, a part of their culture. And so Memphis Meats said, what if we could give them the exact same meat that they already eat, but just produce it in a sustainable, ethical way? Um, and at the time, there was a huge amount of risk ahead of them, right? Where if you had asked me to put a, a, a percentage on the chance of success, it might have it probably would have been less than 20% that they'd be able to sort of scale up and get the cost down. But man, if they could succeed, right, it would not only be a massively profitable business, I mean, as a trillion dollar industry, but it could potentially eliminate one of the worst offenders to our climate crisis, right? And so this is the sort of thing that we love, um, but I, I, I worry because it's the sort of thing that traditional impact investors are very uncomfortable with. And why do I worry about it? I worry about it because these companies that are high risk, um, but if successful, will be massively impactful. Because traditional impact investors are uncomfortable with it, they typically have to turn to the purely greedy capitalist Silicon Valley, Sand Hill Road investors. Um, and those investors, while they understand business and can actually help scale, at the end of the day aren't so interested, with, with few exceptions, in, in the sort of impact missions of these companies. And so if there ever does come a point where there's slight tensions between the two, they're likely to push them in the wrong direction, yeah. right? In the short-term direction. 
Whereas if they had more impact aligned capital, they could protect their impact missions and actually, we think, build even bigger companies and more financially successful companies, but definitely more impactful companies. And so I would love it if this world got more comfortable with the sort of model that, that, that we, we see and, 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 and invest through well, every day. Okay, there's just a little bit of pushback, which is some people think the venture capital model is actually one of the, there's actually two original sins of, of impact <laughs> investing. One is the foundation roots, which sent it down a kind of quasi philanthropy uh, Thing, and obviously foundations have a key role to play, but it got branded as kind of quasi-philanthropy, and that frankly scared off in investors who were looking for these kind of returns. The other original sin, though, was on the other side, which is, you know, it's, it, you know, SoCap sort of in, in the Silicon Valley milieu, and basically the venture, the, the two and 20, 10-year venture fund became now impact funds, the difference being that the payout, there was no 1,000x superstar in the, in the, in the fund, and... And, and looking for that, as you said, could take you off of your impact mission. And so there was a misalignment between the way the funds were structured and the actual ventures that were getting funded or what the, what the kind of capital that those ventures needed, which might be much more prosaic, you know, long-term debt and working capital and all that kind of stuff. And, um, uh, and so the venture model actually um, has now, and you guys are, I'm sure, <laughs> well aware of it, you know, fallen into some at least skepticism um, as, you know, you know, you know, you know, forget about unicorns, you know, you know, what about revenues, you know, um, uh, it, it, there's a lot of, um, of, of, of um, dislocation and um, um, you, you've actually said misappropriation of resources in Silicon Valley, chasing things that are not actually very impactful. So how do you, how do you yeah, square so all there's that? There's a couple of points there. Yeah. So one, um, there was a question somewhere yeah, so, in there. Yeah, so you know, we're, we're trying to like we're <laughs> trying to if you if you build a house, you need a lot of tools. And and frankly, there's so many the, solving all the problems in the world. It's way more complex than building a house. And and venture capital is like a it's like a hammer, right? If you want to nail some things in that house, that hammer is really really great, right? But if you're trying to like uh, uh, sand something, you want to use a hammer, right? And so I think venture capital for a specific type of impact company can be a really great fit. But in other times, you might need patient philanthropic capital. Yeah. And other times, you might need debt capital, right? And so I don't think venture capital is the end-all, be-all, but I do think for this very specific type of company that is high growth, high reward, high risk, venture capital can be really, really great. And then in terms of, of the critiques of venture capital, so you, you sort of mentioned two. So one is that, um, oh, look, there are some really big failures in the world of venture capital. And like that's not that's like that's built into the model, right? So you know, in venture capital, you would expect sometimes there to be really big, massive flameouts. That's a that's a good thing because that's a sign of the overinvestment, lots of research, lots of tries, lots of you know. Exactly, you, you try a lot of big yeah. things, a lot of things will fail. So Jeff Bezos is is, is famous for um, uh, talking at, at Amazon about the number of times Amazon fails big, right? Because he want and he he wants that. So they they launched this thing called the the, the Fire Phone. It was, like, it was like literally an Android competitor. If it was a phone, they sunk a ton of money into it, launched it. It was a complete flop, right? People don't remember that. But like, you know, he wants there to be big failures because that's the only way you get big successes. And so yep. that's, that's okay. Now, the misallocation of resources, this I am on board 100%, right? Yep. But it's not a critique of venture capital as an asset class or as a structure. It's a critique of the current focus of the vast majority of venture capitalists, right? You know, I know so many brilliant people who work in venture capital, run funds. They've maybe built and sold companies for a billion dollars. They have incredible leverage. They have incredible talent, incredible expertise, incredible networks. And what are they doing? They're chasing the next like e-gaming you know, unicorn. And it's, it's just, it's so tragic, right? Because mind -numbing. it's mind-numbing. There's so many huge problems in the world. There's so many opportunities to make money and do good. And these people are funding fr fr frivolities, right? And, and I do think that the vast majority of venture capitalists um, are chasing those silly things. And so I do have a problem with the venture capital industry in general, but it doesn't mean that it can't be fixed, right? But let's assume they're you know, quasi-rational and that they're actually looking at, I mean, everybody always has said in my tech days, you know, big challenges, big solutions, big opportunities, right? Mm -hmm. So the, what, are, what are bigger challenges than, you know, water scarcity, you know, car, you know climate, obviously, you know, food, um, you, know, you know, even housing, s transportation, sanitation. Yeah. Um, but, you know, perhaps like, for example, the biggest uh, climate se uh, carbon sequestration technology at scale is forests, right? But you guys are not looking at forest investment. It's a different oh, oh, kind of are. money, no, right? We are. Oh, you are? Yeah. yeah. Oh, I'd love to be corrected <laughs> on that. Yeah. Yeah. Forest as a technology. Well, there's a yeah. lot of, I mean, there's a lot of interesting tech companies that enable those sort of investments, right? So, you know, they're, they're not in our portfolio, but you yeah. Want, yeah. Well, yeah, I'll jump in for a second. Like Planet Labs is a company that um, Steve and I 
uh, we've been involved with in, in former funds and former lives, but um, planet uh, tiny satellites, basically um, small one, one to three to six U CubeSats uh, that get funneled out of a uh, rocket ship and then uh, basically drag position themselves into a global orbit, taking a picture of every... Um, every portion of the Earth once a day, every day. Uh, and what's amazing is it's actually the most incredible technology for uh, tracking precursors to deforestation because uh, you can actually track change of where people are illegally cutting roads into protected forests of uh, protected parts of the rainforest and go and send in uh, basically troops to stop them before they go and start burning the next part of Brazil. And so that is a brilliant technology that's absolutely right. And then the other aspect is, well, now that the ground actually burned, how do you think about reseeding it in a economically feasible and sustainable and, and high growth way? And so I've been looking at uh, basically seed deployment from drones, although it's a little bit... Um, we can talk about the economics about why that might not work uh, as a as a venture scale business, but we're absolutely looking at like the the Earth knows how to fix itself. Um, we as techno optimists uh, know how to um, kind of hopefully push it in the right direction, but I think we always have this question of saying uh, what's what's the right way in which um, technology accelerates the kind of natural evolutions that mm -hmm. need to happen without causing massive irreparable damage. So we wouldn't invest in a forest plot itself, but right. at the at the carbon symposium, you might have met there was a company called Drone Seed. So you know that's one of these companies. They're, oh, they're, they're going to fire. They're firing yeah. you know trees, trees into through the ground. like these little darts into yeah. the ground yeah. to I plant trees that. more quickly. It's you know not in our portfolio, but a pretty interesting approach. Because they want to get to a billion trees. Billion trees, right? Yeah. So that's a that's a pure tech company that can enable this sort of forest forest play. There's a company that was there called Pachama. They're using satellite imagery from people like Planet plus drone imagery plus lidar and machine learning to figure out where you should plant and to track whether or not those. Uh, forests are actually staying up or getting harvested down so that people can plug into the carbon market. So I think there's a lot of really interesting technology plays that we'd potentially be interested in in that market, just not that we're not buying the forests themselves. Okay, so we're getting... Uh... Oh, wait, we've, we've still got a fair amount of time. Um, so <laughs> Are we boring you? No, no, no. I, 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 thought we were, I, thought, I, I, looked my, I was looking at my clock here and thinking we were done, but we actually have a decent amount of time. So we'll get to some questions. David's sick of us. Um, <laughs> um, the one I want to ask you guys, and then I want to, I want to actually um, have the audience ask it, so I'll cue you up and one of you can ask this, which is the, me the, measure the M word, the measurement question, and how they measure and stuff. I'm not going to ask that, but you all should ask that. Um, the one I want to ask is the unintended consequences uh. one, which is, yeah, I'm sure you get now because unintended consequences um, are rife in technology. Oh. Um, and, uh, you know, you can find that there's some first order positive benefit, but there might be some second or third order negative benefit that you didn't think about. And maybe the net net is either a wash or even negative. And you said, you know, you're a techno optimist. You know, techno, techno optimism was all the rage for a while, and then it sort of now is sort of on the down. <laughs> but you're, you're still a techno optimist. But what is what about how do you think through the un possible unintended consequences? Yeah, I think it's it's a, often a, a difficult question, um, and and there. To say that there's no negative consequences to anything, I think, is kind of folly. Almost, on, almost anything you do, there's some negative consequences. You know, we, we have um, a company in our portfolio called Starsky Robotics. So they're building driverless trucks, right? Um, so why, why is it impactful? Well, A, you know, a million people get killed from trucks being driven poorly because of sleepy drivers every, every year. Um, and B, they can, you know, transportation contributes massively to greenhouse gas emissions. And if all you did was drove existing trucks more efficiently, you would drastically reduce that contribution. Um, but, you know, question, what if, you, if you're building these automated trucks, are you, you're putting drivers out of work? Drivers is one of the most common professions that people have, and that's, that's an obvious negative externality of this company. And so, um, you know, we, 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 we felt very comfortable with Starsky because they're actually using a, a, a teleoperation approach, which is very different than others. So they actually will, will employ drivers in their headquarters, and when the truck gets confused, it calls home, and, or a truck driver drives behind what looks like a super fancy video game setup, drives the trucks. Um, and so they'll actually employ a lot of truck drivers, but for sure less than, than, than uh, have uh, jobs now. And so for us, what we, what we want to see is that the positive impact is just so obviously massive that the, the negative externalities are, are, are sort of washed away, right? And so when it comes to like the climate crisis or a million people dying a year, those are obviously bigger problems 
than you know, people, some people losing their, their jobs, which is unfortunate. Um, and so we, unless it's a very obvious where the impact is here and the negative externality is here, we won't, we won't invest. Uh, I think just, f so one, wholly agreed. Um, uh, and maybe an adjacent point is one of the ways that we think about it is it, it's a little bit of a character test for the founding team, mm. right? So there's this question that we kind of always ask and in a pithy sense, it's, it's basically like, who does your technology screw? Um, and uh, <laughs> terrible to say it that way, but honestly, and uh, it's interesting because. But you hope it's some big incumbent with a fat market that is ready to be uh, sure, disrupted, um, right? Right, in an ideal sense. But what, what I'm actually looking for is a really, really thoughtful answer, because a founder who comes in and says, "Well, this un this upends the oil and gas industry and ends there," that that's not an interesting answer, and mm. um, it really suggests to me. Um, uh, a fallacy in, in a logic train there where they say, you know, we're right, uh, this is our reality distortion, everything's going to be beautiful and roses and puppies once we're successful. Uh, and, and the answer is there's always these hidden externalities that come in from, from, from another industry, from somebody else uh, looking at how to change your technology into a weapon. And I've literally experienced this. My, the first company I started... Um, we thought we had this brilliant solution for long-range low-frequency communication. Turns out it's most useful as a weapons guidance system. And so I, I learned uh, the very hard way that the best of intentions uh, can be met with um, a strong hammer when... Uh, you were, you, sorry, you had invested in it? I had started this company uh, started out, of, out of grad school. And, uh, you know, learn, learn the hard way that uh, good intentions are <laughs> uh, just, you know, pave the road on, on the way to building a very efficient weapons systems. Uh, and it was because we, we hadn't really thought about it back then. We were, we were you know, cl clever graduate students who, who thought we were on to um, some brilliant technology that was going to fix a lot of things. Uh, and it ended up probably helping kill a lot of people, which I don't sleep terribly well at night because of that. And... Um, but just, just, just go yeah. one level deeper. What <laughs> happened to the company and what, how did you deal with it? Uh, I, I can't actually speak uh, very much about what happened to the company uh, because now it's ITAR controlled technology and um, the government is off and running with it. And uh, I really hope that it resurges into more uh, beneficial commercial practices. That kind of thing is what made Tony Stark you know, become Iron Man. Yeah, so. right. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so, so honestly, the, the point is that we, we really sit down and dig in with founders and look for that thoughtful, compelling argument where often the answer is the founder is saying, look, I don't know, but these are the things that keep me up at night. Um, and so really what I'm looking for is someone who's aware enough that they're, you know, they're checking over their shoulder and they're looking behind them and they're saying, what are the ways in which I inadvertently cause damage? Because we can't prevent it, but at least we can be aware of it and hopefully kind of, you know, uh, clot the bleeding early. Right, right. All right, let's, um, let's get some, some questions. Um, I can't see all that well. Maybe if I put my glasses on, it'll be better. Um, and is it, first thing, is it somebody going to ask my measurement question? Oh, come on. <laughs> oh, just come ask on. me yourself. <laughs> <laughs> you want to try? Yeah. Ask your, ask your own question. Ask your own question. Ask your own question. Please. <laughs> okay, thanks. Hi. Um, hi. My question is from Ryan. Um, you, when you said you weren't going to invest in, like you were using all your logic for this uh -huh. nuclear, you know, fusion company, but then you walked in and said, oh, the talent's amazing. Like, it feels like, it, so you didn't walk me through the rest of like how your logic disappeared by, you know, there, we hear so much in terms of like impact investing is a gut, is an instinct. And, you know, a lot of these arguments kind of play out when you have that one moment. And can you, can you walk me through th that transition that you made? Uh, absolutely. Um, and, and I do apologize because right, the problem is that it's so easy to tell these stories where like you come in and you have this big beat over the head moment and that's a much nicer story than the reality, which is um, I spent three weeks up till three o'clock in the morning uh, reading everything I possibly could, uh, calling uh, Nobel physicists, uh, finding every reason to not invest in this company. And um, so, so the short answer is, right, uh, you walk in and you, you get this gut feel. What you actually get is a gut feel of saying, ooh, I might be wrong 
in my fundamental assumptions, right? So I have a really, really strong, strongly held belief, uh, but I'm willing to suddenly to consider reframing it, right? That's what the team gave me that sense of. Not, I walked in there and said, let's write you guys a check. Um, I walked in there and said, I think I don't quite have the same conviction of a hell no that I had when I first walked in this room, and that's enough of a reason for me to go spin up a bunch of work. Um, right, because the reality is like one of our most expensive things is our time. There are like infinite things that we could look at, uh, and limited time, and like we don't scale. It's funny, we, we obsessively invest in scalable businesses, but we don't scale. Oh. <laughs> so we have to be really mindful of our time, and, and keeping everyone at their best and highest use is not spinning up a massive diligence process into something that you're a certain no on. Um, so the things that changed for me is they had excellent answers to the regulatory framework. They had an incredible team. The technical diligence played out. I mean, I had a list of questions like 20 pages long, and then I basically called every person I had ever met in and around nuclear fusion and asked them for their qu hard questions. And so what, what happened is like the feeling changed and then that spun up a process that actually resulted in us saying, okay, now, now we're at a different stage. Now we're really considering investing. And, the, and then you start talking about economics and if the rest of it makes uh, sense. This, this has actually been like a, a a huge part of growth for me. So I, and I was like captain of the math team in high school and like intern at a nuclear physics lab and you know, studied logic and philosophy in college. And so I, I was like rational, 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 rational. Um, and then I came to appreciate that there are some problems or some questions where intuition is really, really valuable and that you can actually get to a better answer more quickly and more accurately than you can through just like a strict rational analysis. And so the key is, is to know what questions intuition is really good at and what questions it's not, right? So uh, I think in terms of like, are, do these founders genuinely care about this? Are they gonna push through the hard times? Do they like each other? Would I wanna work with them? Intuition's amazing for those things, right? Like we've been evolving for a very long time to be good at those types of judgments. Um, but is this technology going to scale and be economical? That's a really bad place for intuition, right? right. And so I think the key is to, is to be very intuitive when it comes to people um, and then, um, for the really hard things like the market or the technology or the scalability to be like hyper, hyper rational. Um, and then when those two things come together, that's when you get really good decisions. Right. And they, we, I mean, our company is kind of like a cognitor competitor potentially. And, and when you guys measure impact, you go, you put all that work into investing, but then do you have the space in your lives to do the math and put in the time to measure the impact of the investment. So with, with Planet Labs, great technology, but are people actually using that to make decisions and therefore impact? And I would argue that better data does not result in perfect decisions because again, to your point, we're instinctive human beings and so we're not necessarily using all the data in the world to make those decisions. So, so yeah, do you guys spend time on the tail end to measure impact as much as you put in it? Thank you. Yeah, also the question <laughs> is like better data for what, right? Because like a lot of things that lead to better decision making or more data can be used both by environmentalists or people that are trying to clean up toxic oil spills, but also by like hedge funds that are exploiting world economies, right? right. And so I think, um, so we have, we have uh, basically two, two broad types of companies. One, companies that are directly having positive impact, right? So like Solugen, like they're just directly doing good, right? For every dollar they make, they're like literally reducing the amount of greenhouse gas in, in the air. And then we have what we call impact infrastructure companies. So Planet is not in our portfolio, but it's this type of company where they might not directly be doing good, but we think that they're going to enable a bunch of other people doing good. So in our portfolio, we have a company called OpenTrans. So they, they automate a lot of work that's done in a wet lab, right? So right now you have PhD level scientists that are like pipetting by hand for hours. These are people who have gone through 12 years of advanced degree schooling. Um, and so OpenTron just builds a really cheap robot that like does all that for them so that they can focus on real science. And so for us, it's like, okay, accelerating scientists, right? Um, what, do, what do scientists generally do? What is the output of science, right? And when we, we actually like, did that analysis and like 90% of the output of science is positive for the world. You know, like maybe like 8% is like just neutral. <laughs> and then there is like sometimes 2% that's like bad for the world, right? Like maybe like nuclear bomb type stuff. Um, and so clearly if you just accelerate scientists, you're gonna have a really positive impact on the world. Um, 
And, and so the question is, how do you actually measure it later on? So we're very fortunate in that we, we're, seed, we're seed investors. So oftentimes we're investing in like, it's three founders in a room, right? And, and so to even measure the financial health of these companies is really difficult at this stage, never, never mind the impact health. Um, but at some point, we of course want to, as we mature as an organization, we've we're only been around for four years, and as our companies mature, we want to make sure that those um, sort of uh, theories of change that we had when we invested were accurate. So that if they were not accurate, we can sort of change our own decision-making process. And so um, we're, what we've basically talked to all of our companies about is, is once you reach scale, where us asking you to fill out paperwork and measure stuff is not potentially going to be an existential threat to your business. And I know it sounds really crazy, but for like a couple founders that are just trying to survive, any additional work is a lot. Um, then we're going to have that conversation with you and figure out how to measure to make sure that you're having the impact you want so that we can make sure we're having the impact we want. Yep. Um, so I, I can't speak directly to Planet um, right now because that was an investment from a former fund, and so hopefully that fund is doing that. Um, and it, within Future Ventures, we're not currently investors in Planet Labs. I can speak to a separate company um, uh, out of uh, Pittsburgh, a handful of Carnegie Mellon professors uh, called Bridge.ai uh, that, that I just invested in. And um, one of the things that we're trying to do is that they're effectively a very clever, um, uh, they're a little bit in stealth mode, so I'm going to figure out how to say this uh, sufficiently broadly. They're, they're basically a very interesting bridge between uh, devices on the edge that are running computer vision models and the, your big mothership backend servers that need to figure out if your model is actually running to spec and if you need to retrain it. But the problem is if you start pummeling all of that data across that's computationally expensive and the energy transfer is expensive, and honestly what most people do today is they like go and shove USB sticks in cameras that are around the world and then ship them back and figure out you know, if the real world data is useful. And so like the whole thing, one, it doesn't scale. A ton of data is ref left on, on the floor. Uh, and there's a lot of places that we're not deploying interesting, clever things that could be collecting more useful data because of this kind of um, transfer problem. Uh, so these guys have a very clever solution about how to, how to make it far more efficient and how to only send the data back that will actually tell you, is your model performing to spec? And if not, what pieces you should retrain on? Uh, and one of, the, one of the questions that we have is, how do we qualify the impact of this company going right seed stage? Literally four people working on it. I think you know we went from like four to eight people in the last two weeks. So massive growth. Um, but one of the fundamental questions, like, what's a KPI of this company on? Uh, what are the right metrics to measure? And we we started thinking about it. We're basically A/B testing of like, what what is the right measurement? Is it like total bits transferred? Is it over potential? Like, what's the numerator and the denominator? And and the answer is we have honestly no idea. But we're gonna measure a bunch of things and figure out which one, and not that just tells our story better, right? Because like, I can generate data that makes me look good. Um, but which one is actually an effective measure of an impact of right. change? Uh, and, and I think that's very not true. Like, that's, that's like fundamental work that we, none of us really have a great answer to. And if we did, then it would already exist. Like, this is right, it, it's, this is like baseline principles. One of the things that, that, that I've always thought as a, when I talked about the parallels between the tech story and the impact story is that there's, um, tech story's always been about driving costs, you know, radically lower and also driving volumes radically higher. So, yeah. um, so that's not that dissimilar from what the base of the pyramid economic mm -hmm. argument has been, which is you could have very profitable businesses at very low margins and with very affordable and quality services for many, many more people. And that that's uh, an off, often tech enabled, whether it's obviously the mobile phones is a classic example, but solar energy is on that pathway, and now FinTech is on that pathway. Um, how do you guys think about the massive, the, 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 the true scaling tech thing to mil billions of people who may be very low income? Think about it in two ways. So uh, one, not all companies follow that model. So Apple is known for only selling super expensive stuff at very high margins, and you know I, I don't know if they're the most valuable company in the world today, but they they often are. And so exception that proves the rule. Yeah, we're we're, we're, we're fine um, with that model so long as it will impact everyone. So just because just to, to to positively impact a life doesn't mean you actually have to provide a service directly to that person, right? So Solugen 
will, will never sell to 99.99% of people, right? Because they're making industrial chemicals and selling into industry. Um, but they will benefit everyone because they're tackling the climate crisis. So that we're, we're, very, we're very okay with. Um, and then other, uh, other companies in our portfolio um, that direct that where, where the benefit is provided by an interaction with the company, we want to see a path to them reaching everyone in the world. If they don't have to do it right away, right? Because um, it's hard enough to build a scalable business, um, and doing it when at a price point where everyone can afford it from the get-go is oftentimes impossible, right? So um, I actually think that the Tesla model is kind of interesting, right? So Elon, from the very early days, laid out a, a master plan, he called it. And he said, we want to build affordable electric cars for everyone. How are we going to start? We can't do that now. So we're going to start by selling 100 of these super awesome sports cars for a million dollars each. And then we're going to use that capital and that scale to drive down our costs, increase our scale, and then build this like, you know, luxury car that costs $80,000. And then we're going to repeat, and then we're going to have a Model 3 that's going to be $30,000. And then we're going to make something even cheaper. And sure enough, they've been doing that, right? And so we have a company in our portfolio called Astronus. So they're building small geostationary satellites to cover the Earth and Internet. So there's 4 billion people right now who have no access to the Internet. And this isn't like poor access or intermittent access, they just, they've never been connected. Um, and there's only so many ways of getting service to those people, right? You know, and running wires is prohibitively expensive. Google's trying these, like, giant balloons, but right. they can't get above 80% availability. Facebook tried solar-powered drones, but shut that project down. And so most smart people have decided that satellites are the answer. And so Astronus is building these small satellites that can provide really, really cheap uh, bandwidth. Um, now, their initial customer base are going to be people in the developed world who aren't connected, right? So they just closed a large contract to cover Alaska and internet. Um, why? Because those people can pay more, and while Astronus isn't at scale yet, Astronus costs are higher. But as they get to scale and Astronus costs reduce, then they can offer bandwidth at a lower cost point, and so their goal is to reach the four billion in the developing world who have no access, right? And so uh, th those are the sort of two models, and if the latter one, we definitely want to see a way that it can serve everyone. Great, great. Let's get some questions and you can chime in. Right here? Yeah. We have one up there. Oh, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Hi. Sorry about that. Um, I really enjoyed the discussion around risk. I think a lot of panels and maybe a lot of themes this whole weekend are about how a lot of roadblocks we see with investment stems from this whole lack of diversity and inclusion within the investor pool. And so I was wondering in the discussion today whether or not you think that that also plays a role in the whole risk tolerance or intolerance that you were discussing earlier? Uh, I think it's a huge problem in the industry. I don't know if it exacerbates the problems around risk tolerance or intolerance, right? So I, I think that, you know, the, the venture capital industry is like overwhelmingly male, especially if you look at decision makers and overwhelmingly white. Um, and I think that leads to a lack of perspectives that A, leads to better financial returns. I mean, this is, I think, the, uh, the right. argument that I use for people who I don't necessarily think care about the diversity from like the, the way we care about it, which is from like the moral standpoint, there's a lot of studies that show that it just boosts returns. <laughs> Having women on your investment team boosts returns. Having diverse perspectives boosts returns. And so um, it's, it's bad for the industry both in terms of returns and it's bad because it definitely impacts what sorts of things get funded. I think oftentimes there are blind spots because these partnerships are so homogenous. Um, so yeah, but I don't know if it exacerbates the particular problem in terms of risk, uh, risk tolerance. Yeah, possibly the only thing that it exacerbates is that, um, to your point of that, um, it, people have a particular mindset, right? And a particular risk tolerance inherently because of their lives, their education, their experience. And so if your entire investment community looks roughly the same, uh, they have roughly the same risk tolerance and perception of whatever they're looking at. And so the question is, um, my assumption uh, is that if you add more diversity in the investment pool, then you possibly don't change the level of risk, but you kind of broaden the horizon of what they're looking at and possibly become just uh, slightly more comfortable with something that a different perspective would otherwise just not understand. So I, I think exactly to your point that the proof is in the data. Diversity boosts uh, performance, and so we should optimize for that. Um, one, from a moral standpoint, but also just from a return standpoint. Like, it's obvious. We call that one, that's one of the key sources of impact alpha. Actually, Mariana um, queued me up for this, so I'm going to ask it. Uh, number uh, or percentage uh, of founders uh, and CEOs in portfolio companies, women and people of color? Can I crawl Six, under my 68%. table? 68%. Nice 68% work. what? Of our founders. 68% of our companies have an underrepresented founder. 68. 68%, yeah. Um, this is where I start digging a hole under my chair. Um, 
I, I could give you a list of excuses, which are, you know, we just got started as a fund. This is, we are not even through our first year. The simple reality is we haven't done a great job on this yet. Uh, we have 10 investments to date, uh, of which every, I will give my founders incredible credit in that um, it, within the executive team, they're, uh, in every case but one is kind of an underrepresented uh, group. But uh, we have not done as good a job as we could um, and should have, and I'm actively working on that. And you know, part of it is just this question of uh, fixing our funnel, and the second is just actually making a, a better trajectory. And at the same time, I'm not going to uh, change uh, the standards or my interest areas. Uh, and so, th right, there, there's a push and a pull here. And uh, I think Future Ventures needs to do a better job on this, and we will, and we're aware of it. And that's that's the trajectory not that to, we're going not, on. Not, not to be um, uh, yeah. rude, but just my journalistic uh, yeah. ethics yeah. require me to actually press that the actual answer to the question of yeah, so the number we, is. We don't have any female CEOs. Uh, we do have... Um, founder like so so from that from a gender bias perspective we have no female ceos in the portfolio and uh 10 companies to date so you know so you're leaving some leaving some returns on the table there. yeah a lot <laughs> <laughs> all right one more question figure out um i guess okay there mike off. is here and i called on you earlier oh so i that, lied so. we have we have one but it's spacex so i don't know if that counts okay gwen is well is, you, know. you gotta you gotta have one to get to, to two to three to four all right Thank you for such an engaging discussion. Um, so I want to go back to when you were talking about markets for all of these technologies. And this hasn't come up yet, but given the kind of technology you invest in and the scope of impact, I would imagine that governments would make really good customers. And so first of all, is that true? And second, uh, if that's the case, then from a VC perspective, how do you think about you know, regulation and then the returns that you that your portfolio companies would make? Governments are the best of the best and the worst, worst of the of worst, worst of customers. They are the yeah. worst because it is a very, very long sales cycle, which for startups can be very, very tough. The process is often incredibly political, where it's more about, obviously, these are run by politicians, more about who you know than the quality of the product. Um, and then they're the best of the best because governments spend a huge amount of money. And if you can get one of these contracts, oftentimes they will sign a 10-year exclusive contract, and you just really don't have to worry about it anymore. And of course, from the impact perspective, governments have massive scale. Um, and so I would say those two things kind of come together for us and, and make us neutral. Uh, so we're, we're not like more excited if you're serving governments or less excited because there's obviously pros and cons. Yeah, I mean, if, you, if, you're, if your business lives and dies by winning a government contract, it will die. Um, most likely if it's a seed stage company and you didn't just uh, leave a job as the Joint Chiefs of Staff, basically, right? So, so unless you have some unique perspective about why you single-handedly, as an individual, will win a contract because of a series of relationships you have, you're in a really bad place. So honestly, some of the most successful companies that we've seen that have relied on uh, that have successfully won and executed on government contracts are ones that are basically started by billionaires or phenom phenomenally wealthy people to begin with so that the level of access is just, it's, right, they have this unfeathered level of access that uh, accelerates them forward versus um, three people right out of grad school. It's, it's such an uphill battle. Then you say, is this really the correct trajectory? And if it is, are you guys really the right people to do it? Which is a little unfortunate. Great. Well, we are in overtime now, so let's leave it there. Um, thank you, Mariana and Seth and all of you. And um, uh, have a great uh, day at SOCAP. And, and, and that's it. Thanks for getting thank up. You. <laughs> thank you, David. Thank you.